Good morning. I would like to call the Hillsborough County Metropolitan Planning Organization meeting to order. Uh, would everyone please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance and Invocation? And I don't see a flag, uh, oh. so we'll just. Uh, do we have one? We do. Okay, there we go. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you touch us with your loving hands to awaken us to come together this morning to work to make this county a better place for all of us to live, work, and play. We ask that you regulate our minds and humble our hearts as we make those decisions. Father, we ask that you be with each and every one of us and people throughout this county, this state, this country, this world as we continue to deal with this pandemic. Father, we ask that those that are sick, that you touch them with your healing hands and those that have lost loved ones, you put your loving arms around them to comfort them. We ask that you uh, protect our first responders, whether they're in the hospitals and taking care of those sick or in uniform, maybe military uniform or police uniform, any other uniform that puts their lives on the line for us each and every day. We ask you to protect them. And when our work is done today, we ask you to take us back to our homes to find everything safe and sound. These are all blessings we ask in your righteous and holy name. Amen. Uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Les Miller, Jr. Here. Ms. Paul Anderson. Charles Clue. Councilman Joseph Citro. Present. Councilman John Dingfeld. <coughs> Commissioner Ken Hagen. Here. Mr. Adam Harden. Melanie Williams. Commissioner Pat Kemp. Mr. Joe Lapano. Here. Mayor Rick Lott. Nate Kilton. Councilman Guido Maniscalco. Mr. Michael Marino. Here. Commissioner Kimberly Overman. Here. Mayor Andrew Ross. Here. Commissioner Mary Ellis Smith. Cindy Stewart. Steve Kona. Mr. Joseph Wagner. Here. Thank you. Do we have a quorum? Commissioner, this is Cameron Clark. Okay. I can't, okay. I can't, okay. it's a bare quorum. Is it bad for you doing the same thing? What? I think I counted nine members. So it is. Which would be a quorum. Okay. Commissioner Miller. Much. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, yes. Uh, I just want to say I'm present. This is Pat Camp. Okay. Mr. Chair, we see that Melanie Williams with heart is also present. Okay. All right. Very good. Ms. Williams is present. Okay. Uh, you should have received the minutes from the June 30th, 2020 meeting. Uh, are there any corrections or additions to the minutes? If not, I have a motion to approve the minutes. Motion to approve. Any motion by Commissioner Overman? Is there a second? Second. A second by Councilman Dane Felder. Uh, seeing no further uh, discussion, please call the roll to approve the minutes. Commissioner Les Miller, Chief. Clerk there. Uh, yes. Okay. Mr. Paul Anderson. Uh, Charles Kluge, Paul Anderson, yes. Charles Kluge, thank you very much. Councilman Joseph Citro. Yes. Councilman John Dingfelder. Yes. Commissioner Ken Hagen. Yes. Melanie Williams. Yes. Commissioner Pat Kemp. Yes. 
Villapano? Yes. Mayor Rick Lott? Or Nate Kilton? Councilman Guido Maniscalco? Mr. Michael Marino? Yes. Commissioner Kimberly Overman? Yes. Mayor Andrew Ross? Yes. Commissioner Mary Ellis Smith? Yes. Stewart? Or Steve Kona? Mr. Joseph Wagoner? Yes. Thank you. By your vote, minutes have been approved. Uh, we're now moving to public comment. Each speaker uh, has 30, I'm sorry, three minutes for, to speak. We've set aside 30 minutes for public comment. Do we have anyone signed in for public comment? Do we have anyone signed in for public comment? Yes, Mr. Chair, we have Chris Vela. Pardon me? Chris Vela. Okay, Mr. Vela, good morning. You have three minutes. Good morning. I wish I had 30. <laughs> okay. Um, first of don't all, worry, buddy, I just don't wanted, <laughs> I know. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say thank you for uh, those on the board uh, that have listened to me and um, made some really good pointed questions to DOT the last meeting. That, that meant a lot to me. For the those who didn't, I, I hope you all get it one day. Um, I want to walk really quickly through the history of our interstate system. Um, in 1955, way before I was born, um, this project, I-4 and I-275, started at a 90% subsidy. So the federal government gave Florida 90% match. No, no funds owed back. A 90% match to build a highway. In 1957, we saw FDOT's plan. And it included the 14th and 15th Street exits. That's right. From 63 years ago, we had the exit, those exits on the downtown interchange. And that's when the redlining occurred. And the redlining, what I mean by that is when we started to divide the communities based on color, skin color, and wealth. And so there is a strong connection between the highway plan and how we fragmented our communities administratively. In 1988, FDOT does their first editorial for the Tampa Interstate Study, which is a, a predecessor to the Tampa Bay Next. They say, the FDOT says in this article, that 4,000 properties would be displaced. Now, we don't really know from 89 to this point how many properties were displaced, but I, I do know it's probably at least over 1,000. Um, going over to 1989, um, we saw a bunch of uh, land uh, being turned over to roads in South County. There was an MPO commissioner that was tied to this effort. There was also a planning commissioner tied to this effort. The reason why I'm bringing this up is because those roads that were lobbied by public servants and the people outside of that group got their, got their roads in South County adopted in a 2010 MPO plan, right? There's no transit. Um, and if we fast forward into present day right now, the I-4 connector, if you guys, and I can give you all this information, if you look at the map right now, Google Earth, you will see disconnected ramps going into Ybor, going east towards uh, I-4. Those ramps haven't been finished. So by you all approving TVNEX, you're going to see the downtown interchange explode. And I, there's about three connections of ramps that are disconnected. They stopped for some odd reason in 2009, but those are going to be built and more homes are going to be destroyed in East Tampa as well as in Ybor City. And my last point here is that in, we had a Transportation for America study that was just released two days ago. And right now we are designing at 108% capacity of, of pop, uh, population growth, right? But our real population growth for Tampa is only 51%. Our, our congestion, because we're doing so much induced demand, is nearly 150%. The reason why these numbers are so crazy is because we're just designing the wrong roads, for one. We're not designing to reconnect neighborhoods and local streets. We're investing too much on highways, so we have a lot of congestion, and we're 
making so, so many roads beyond our population number. So this is hard evidence in Transportation for America. I will send it to all of you guys. And please take a look at it. And also, we are number two. We lead number two with the most roads in the whole entire state. So we're 5,300 miles of roads all the way since the beginning of time. And that's uh, going from Tampa to uh, the North Pole. So that's all I got to say. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone um, else uh, speaking? Yes. Excuse me. This is the uh, reporter. I was just going to ask if everybody can mute. I'm getting a lot of feedback that who's not talking. Okay. When you're when you're not speaking, please mute your your microphones, please. Do we have anyone else speaking in the public comment? There are no further comments. Okay. Thank you very much. That closes the public comment section of the meeting. We now move to uh, committee reports and advanced comments. Uh, Mr. Bill Roberts, uh, CAC Chair, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the MPL Board. I'm Bill Roberts, Chairman of your CAC Committee. Um, I have a couple of items to report. Um, the CAC held a workshop on July the 15th uh, to delve into the fiscal impact analysis uh, by CAC representative from Plant City. Uh, we went over his analysis and heard from several invited guests uh, who offered their comments and their thinking about development decisions for Plant City in the East County area. Uh, secondly, um, the CAC held a, an ad hoc subcommittee meeting on June the 23rd. The purpose of this subcommittee meeting was to craft a proposed resolution uh, taking a stand against discrimination and promoting racial equity in transportation. Uh, we expect that your Citizens Advisory Committee will consider uh, this resolution at our August meeting. Um, thirdly, I want to thank the MPO Board for your uh, timely uh, consideration of the recommendations from the Citizens Advisory Committee uh, at your MPO TIP hearing on June the 30th. Um, I will tell you that your CAC continues to, uh, to um, advance uh, and explore opportunities for transportation and recommendations to bring before you. You have 23 devoted citizens who uh, volunteer their time to come to these meetings sometime lengthy, and we appreciate your consideration of our recommendations. That concludes my report. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Roberts. Any questions, Mr. Roberts? Any questions? Thank you very much. Ms. Thank Wanda you. West. Good morning, um, MPO board and Wanda West, MPO staff. The Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Committee took a summer recess from its monthly meeting. Instead, the committee held a virtual workshop to discuss items for future consideration. Requests were made for presentations from the City of Tampa and Hillsborough County staff focusing on planned and recently completed pedestrian and bicycle projects. Committee members also supported additional speed studies, including areas around USF and the need for more consistent maintenance of existing bicycle and pedestrian facilities throughout the county. The Intelligent Systems and Intelligent Transportation Systems Committee held its quarterly meeting and heard status reports on performance evaluation of the e-scooter deployment in the city of Tampa, Smart Cities Mobility Plan the Scope Review, Seed Pilot, Lessons Learned in the Tampa Bay Next Update West State Trip, which is a comprehensive transportation management plan to address traffic management, regional, regional demand, innovation and in smart work zones, and public engagement. The Chair's Coordinating Committee for Hillsborough, Pinellas, Pasco, Polk, Hernando Citrus, and Sarasota Manatee MPOs met for an annual review of regional priorities. The CCC approved for consensus updated priority list for transportation, regional incentive program, and for regional multi-use trails, including Sun Trail corridors. The CCC also was briefed on a regional long-range transportation plan summary document that is currently being drafted. Following the CCC's business meeting, a joint meeting was held with the Central Florida MPO Alliance, including a panel discussion with three Florida Department of Transportation District Secretaries and the Assistant Secretary of Florida Department of Transportation. 
the Tampa Bay Regional Area Transportation Authority provided a briefing on the new regional transit development plan. The Tampa Bay Transportation Management Area Leadership Group members discussed the role of TBARTA in transit agencies in delivering transit in the region. This topic will be explored more at the September quarterly meeting of the TMA. Staff received emails thanking them for coordinating the CCC board meeting and for holding a virtual meet and greet for Eric Holt, the West Chase Community Association Governing Affairs Committee Chair. Mr. Holt inquired about trails in the Citrus Park area and staff provided a response. There were no Facebook comments or voicemail messages received prior to the meeting. This concludes my report. Thank you, Ms. West. Any questions of Ms. West? Any questions of Ms. West? Thank you very, very much. We're now moving to action items and all these action items will require a roll call vote. So our first one is committee appointments, Ms. Cheryl Wilkening. Good morning, Cheryl Wilkening, MPO staff. Uh, the Transportation Disadvantage Coordinating Board nominated council member Gil Schistler for Hart. The Intelligent Transportation Systems Committee nominated Daniel Budens, FDOT advisor and Judith Villages, alternate for Thea. The Citizens Advisory Committee nominated Don Skelton Jr. for the Tampa Port Authority. Recommended action is the MPO confirm these appointments. Are there any questions? Are there any questions? Seeing none, may I have a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Second. Second. Motion by Commissioner Overman. Second by, I think I saw Ms. Melody Williams second. Uh, seeing no further discussion, please call the roll. Commissioner Les Miller. Yes. Charles Klug. Yes. Joseph Sintro. Yeah. Don Dinkfelder? Yes. Ken Hagen? Yes. Melanie Williams? Yes. Pat Kemp? Yes. Joe Lopano? Yes. Mayor Rick Lott or Nate Kilton? Councilman Guido Maniscalco? Yes. Michael Marino? Yes. Kimberly Overman? Yes. Andrew Ross, Mayor Andrew Ross? Yes. Mary Ellen Smith? Yes. Cindy Stewart or Steve Connor? Joseph Wagner or Bob Fry? Yes, Joseph Wagner. Wagner. Okay, thank you. By your vote, the uh, motion is adopted. We're now moving to Vision Zero Speed Management Action Plan. Paula Flores. Um, good morning, uh, board members. This is Gina Torres on your staff. And I just wanted to introduce this item, if I could, uh, for just a second. Mm -hmm. I wanted to remind the board that almost three years ago, you took the leadership to bring the national movement of Vision Zero to our community. And what better place to make that commitment um, that we can't accept even a life loss uh, when we average about 200 deaths a year and 1,600 people are, are seriously injured. So in a moment, you're going to hear about a study that came out of the futures will not be like the past action track. But I just wanted to just uh, bring some attention to another of the action tracks, the One Message, Many Voices, um, just to kind of, I haven't presented before you in a little bit. And um, one of the goals of that action track is to engage with the victims of traffic violence. And two days ago on Sunday, I spent almost more than half an hour with um, on the phone with Trinity Rath. Trinity's a college student in Orlando. She was raised in the Sasso though. And, she clearly remembers the last day of her junior year of high school um, when she received a call that her grandmother was killed in traffic. She called uh, Leela Reed, her mom, uh, until the age of 12, and Leela was her life. It's taken her about two years uh, for Trinity to find the strength, according to her words that she got from her grandmother, um, to share her story. She actually just Googled and reached out and got San Francisco's 
Vision Zero network. And that kind of made its way to me so that I could call her. And she really wants to uh, make a difference so that others don't have to go through this raw uh, heartache, you know, that she and her family are feeling. Um, so she has some ideas that she wants to engage her peers and she's looking to me to help her uh, share her story. I just want to Leela's crash uh, remains really clear in my mind and memory because she died the same day that Jessica and Lilia died on Bayshore. Leela was on 40th Street and hours before her own death, she had called her, her daughters to tell her about the crash on Bayshore and to say, honey, be, be careful. So just in those two crashes alone, we have witnesses, we have the driver, the drivers, we have the family members and loved ones and friends that are, that's just one day. Those are just two crashes that have really uh, changed the life of so many people. And these stories um, are important to share. So I just wanted to kind of bring it back to why we're doing this. Um, I'm really proud of the study you're about to see, which is, um, a, can potentially directly impact and change uh, so that other people don't have to contact me <laughs> and tell me about their loved one's loss. So I just wanted to um, introduce Paula, who is going to tell you about a study that we are wrapping up, and I hope that uh, we'll get your support for this. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioner Miller and board members. Um, this is going to be a, just a 15-minute summary of a lot of work that has been accomplished over the last year. The full report covers a lot of the background and in-depth look at the elements that I will cover for you today. Next slide. So, you know, this, like Gina said, this is a very important step to take furtherance of both, not just the Hillsborough NPO's Vision Zero policy, but also the Complete Streets policy. The transportation reforms that have been going out throughout the nation on how to address dangerous streets have been a guide throughout this process for us. So you may be asking, why should we care about speed management and safety? And, and the answer is simple, because it affects quality of life. It affects how you get around. It, it affects public health and safety and economic development in our community. So this action plan, however, is not a policy statement nor a directive to any local agency, but rather a next step towards reducing fatal and serious injury crashes through identification of best practices that have been proven, not just nationally, but also locally. Next slide. And as Gina just mentioned, three years ago, the NPO took on the challenge of developing a Vision Zero Action Plan you know, but we couldn't deny that our alarming high injury and fatality rates were leading the country. And the good work being done locally hadn't been effective enough at reducing the number of lives lost. It, so it was time to really elevate this issue. Next slide. And it is under the Vision Zero Action Plan, like G Gina just mentioned, that future is not like the past, the goal number one that recognizes the critical need our community has in addressing speeds on our streets. Next slide. And this is really because year after year, we remain in the nation's top 10 metro areas with highest pedestrian fatalities. And in Florida is the most dangerous state in the nation for pedestrians and bicyclists. Next slide. And with an average of 200 plus fatalities a year in Hillsborough County alone, a person is dying on Hillsborough streets every other day. And we have become complacent when we see the news each, each time. Next slide, please. So the action plan has just one simple goal, and that is to improve public health and safety by reducing road fatalities and serious injuries. But our desired outcomes are many such as improving safety experience for all road users, increasing awareness, institutionalizing good practices, identifying supportive policies and programs, and of course, we couldn't be successful without obtaining the cooperation and the support of all the stakeholders. Next slide. So the scope for this Hillsborough County plan included five tasks that covered, you know, stakeholder involvement, review of speed management practices, prioritization of the high injury quarters, and then the development of the action plan. 
I will go over them very, very quickly for you. Next slide. So task one was the stakeholder engagement, which included the cities, the county, the school district, law enforcement, transit agency, and even the health department. The stakeholder team met four times over the year and shared different agency efforts that are ongoing. It shared priority metrics for us to consider through this process and countermeasures to be added to our toolkit, which I'll talk about a little later. And of course, the stakeholder group had the opportunity as well to provide input on the action plan. Next slide. So the uh, test two on speed management practices, we did solicit examples, not only from our local partners, but we also reviewed other statewide efforts and, but the study itself is really reliant heavily on national best practices, as this is an emerging practice in safety throughout the nation. Next slide. But it is clear by various national agencies, such as the National Safety Council, that with the right policies, technologies, and strategy, we could and can prevent all roadway deaths. Next slide. Speeding related crashes have significant impacts on society, but unfortunately it has been normalized. This is a national problem, but we do have effective solutions that must be applied locally. We do have guidance, we do have tools, and we do have the collaborative approach needed to truly start making a difference in our community. Next slide. If there, if there is one slide, I want you to remember is this one. The fatality and serious injury risk increases significantly as speeds increases. For example, at 20 miles per hour, if a pedestrian or a bicyclist is hit by a vehicle, it will have an 80% chance of survival. While at 40 miles per hour and above, a pedestrian bicyclist hit will have a 20% survival rate. Any street with speeds above 40 miles an hour will likely result in crashes with deadly consequences. This is because when driving at higher speeds, your periphery vision is notably reduced, which then requires increased reaction time to stop before a collision occurs. And at these higher speeds, the force of impact is too much for the human body to withstand. Next slide. So there's transformative approaches across the country to manage speed. And this is because speed limits today, unfortunately, have become the minimum travel speed instead of the maximum speed that it truly is. Next slide. Cities across the nation have recognized the significance of speed on eliminating fatalities and are now reducing speeds across their cities. Some of the initial reports from the early adopters are showing significant positive effects on reducing crashes, fatal and injury crashes. Next slide. But you don't have to go very far because even locally, we have seen the successful results. Oh, I'm gonna skip, hold on a second. Okay, just a quick reminder that this plan's attributes are based on the USDOT publication on speed management. It is data driven. We are looking at applying basic principles at all levels. We are looking at establishing appropriate safe speeds. We are looking to institutionalize good practices with cooperation from tra traffic safety stakeholders. Next slide, please. Here it is. So even locally, we have seen the successful results from application of national best practices, including reduction of the speed limit on Fletcher Avenue. The changes on Fletcher have had notable positive effects on reducing fatal crashes by approximately 60% reduction in serious injuries by 46%. We have had great compliance with mid-block crosswalks and with little impact really on the travel speeds in the quarter. So this is what this plan is really all about, doing more to provide safer streets. This is urgent because the benefits that have been proven is now time to just do it. It is time we institutionalize these practices for use across our community. Next slide. But before I get to this next segment, I also wanted to bring everybody up to date. We just got some fantastic news. You know, in 2017, when the National Transportation Safety Board recommended an overhaul on how speed is managed on U.S. streets, including how to set speed limits, 
The National Association of City Transportation Officials, which is NACTO, just this past week, I think it was on Thursday, released a new publication called City Limits, which is how to set speeds on urban streets. This document provides guidance, not just how to set speed limits throughout a region. It talks about how designing slow zones like neighborhoods and around schools or, or on quarters. So this is a must new, uh, it's a new publication and it is a must read by all professionals and elected officials. All right, so on to task three. Now the quarter prioritization process is the guide on the evaluation of various community focus factors along a quarter. Next slide, please. We started with a data-driven approach. We looked at all the crashes and here are some of the fatal crash trends we found for the top 20 high injury quarters in Hillsborough County. 83% occurred during non-peak hours. When traffic is less, congestion is less, and an abundant capacity on our streets is available. 71% at aggravated driving speed-related contributing factors. Almost 60% happened actually at mid-block locations, not at intersections. And 92% of all the fatal crashes that have occurred on the, the top 20 occurred on streets with posted speeds in excess of 40 miles an hour. Next slide. So we started. The table, oops. The, uh oh, okay, right there, right there, sorry. So we started by evaluating speed limits to see if they were appropriate and rational for the context of the community. What this table shows is that when posted speeds are compared to national best practices identified by ITE and CNU, 70% of the quarters in the top 20 have posted speeds in excess of five to 10 miles per hour. And 15% of these quarters have posted speeds of 15 to 20 miles per hour above national practice. So please note that most drivers travel at five to 10 miles per hour above the posted speed. So we do have a problem and a very serious one, no less. So if we don't manage speed, we will not achieve vision zero goals. Next slide. But changing speed limits on our streets is not going to happen overnight. We should not just go out there and change the speed limit signs everywhere. It should be done, however, in combination with other traffic calming countermeasures. Even just adopting, for example, though, a context classification for each road with a proper target speed per national best practices is critical variable. It is a critical variable in designing streets because speed limits affect many design variables, such as how long turn lanes are and need to be, sight distance, how wide travel lanes are, et cetera. So bottom line, changing speed limits isn't the only task but it is a critical element for better street systems of our future. Next slide. One of the other tasks that we had to perform was to determine how to prioritize the high injury quarters. So besides just looking at the severity crash rate, seven factors were evaluated and used, such as the ones posted on the slide, posted speed context class that I just mentioned, regional equity and um, low income, um, and so forth, crash history, proximity to schools, ped bike injuries, transit routes, and access, and of course, geometric features. We developed a risk performance level uh, that simply states, the higher the exposure, the more likely the severity crashes can occur, the higher the points that were applied to the quarters, hence the higher the priority a quarter should be. Next slide, please. So the table in front of you summarizes the priority matrix for each or for the top 20 quarters. We gave these factors a weighted average and then developed the final score shown in the last column called our priority scoring. But what this exercise really indicated to us is that if we all only look at the severity crash rates, we may not be investing in the quarters with the greatest need. Next slide. Now, some of the quarters on the top 20 were already under evaluation by their jurisdictional agency. We were asked to identify the next 30, what's next, and prioritize them. Next slide. 
The next 30 uh, high injury quarters, um, the map shows actually the existing 20 in blue and the next 30 in green. I know it's hard to read, but we have a lot of work to do ahead of us. Next slide. And these quarters were also evaluated and prioritized using the same methodology I described just a second ago. And here's the prioritization of the next 30 quarters. And these will be very helpful for all the agencies involved. Next slide. So now we get to the exciting part. Um, we're gonna go over some of the strategies and countermeasures and actions to be taken moving forward. Next slide. Per Vision Zero principles, however, safety is very complex. In order to have safe travel for all users, we must have safe streets, safe speeds, safe vehicles, and safe people. But considering that a third of the U.S. population does not drive, especially the most vulnerable, safe people should be our highest priority. So focusing on people first will also create better outcomes on our streets, including improved walkability, livability, connectivity to services, to jobs, to schools, and to parks. Next slide. A safe systems approach to the application of safety countermeasures is a must to prevent fatal crashes from happening. And so we, this pretty much says we have to be proactive, not reactive. And looking simply at just the hotspots is insufficient. So we must take a very holistic view of all the roads, the features, the contacts, the users, and the connectivity needs of the system. Next slide. So what we have done through this process is create an aggressive driving crash countermeasure toolkit that starts with safe people first, really. This toolkit provides all the national and international good practices at your fingertips right in this document, but it's, it is not all exhausted. And we also have um, customized it in order to meet some of the needs and the conditions that we saw in the Hillsborough County quarters. So the toolkit also indicates, for example, on this table, what area, for example, is, is it applicable in an urban area, suburban area, or rural, or location type, is it appropriate in an intersection, in a slow street, a neighborhood street, or an arterial? So the toolkits, um, uh, the Safe People Toolkit actually includes raised pedestrian crossings, for example, wider sidewalks, refuge islands, pedestrian crossings, and the whole list. It just keeps on going. Next slide. The next part of the toolkit is about safe streets. You know, and it includes traffic calming techniques, narrow travel lanes, roundabouts, raised intersections, eliminating acceleration lanes, which we see a lot here in Hillsborough, street lighting, two-way streets, and of course, always reevaluating the context class of a quarter and also its target speed. Next slide. The next uh, toolkit piece is about safe streets. We also include countermeasures for freeway interchanges that we found on several quarters like Dale Mabry and others. And it includes redesigning some of these high speed off ramps, providing safe continuous bike lanes and reevaluating its speed. Safe traffic operations in the lower half of the table includes increasing the number of traffic signals to provide more connectivity, LPIs, RRBs, lower speeds, target speed for signal coordination, and even automated enforcement. Next slide, please. So for this section, I'm just gonna go refer you really to the full report, which is in depth. Um, so I'm gonna simply go over and highlight some of the actions for each of the sections on how to uh, set speeds, engineering operations, education, policy, and legislative, and evaluation. There are many examples, again, in the full report that I, I hope all of you have had an opportunity to look at. Next slide. So let's start with speed setting. Under this speed setting, there are three actions that were identified for this category. For each of the actions, the plan also identifies if it's a short, if it's a mid, or a long-term effort. Next slide, please. For engineering and operations, we actually had identified eight actions that covers a wide spectrum of elements, including the need to evaluate all 50 quarters that had um, been prioritized, updating design manuals, you know, more design flexibility, uh, local street design guidelines, and professional training and funding actions. 
Next slide. For education, um, there are three action items that were identified, starting with education and training, not just for public, but also elected officials, eventually drafting a speed management policy if necessary, and a development of PSA messages on various topics about how to use, not only for all road users, how to use the streets safely, but, but also a lot of other measures that I had incorporated in there. Next slide, please. For policy and legislative, this is something that as transportation professionals, we really don't go into or do a lot of work in this area, but we did identify five actions covering how to set speed limits. It's something that we have to really update and, and uh, make sure that we're com in conformance with national best practices that are out there today. How to set aggressive vision zero goals, you know, that are that are quicker, that there's more urgency to them so we can see bigger results or more results in saving lives. You know, updating land use policies, for example, making sure that, our, that we have mixed use land uses, that we have grid street systems, that we provide multimodal access to all of them, or how to make sure that we have safe access to all our neighborhood schools in our communities. So we have to think about all of these things that really affect our community as a whole. But then also look at initiating new traffic safety legislation. You know, what is it that we need? What tools do we, could we use in this toolkit for us to be more effective at saving more lives? So we have a lot of work to do ahead of us, but this is a great outline of things that we should start thinking about in our community. Next slide. And then the last slide is really just on uh, evaluation of the plan. It simply calls for routine updates. Let's see where we are in saving lives, but establishing also qualitative and quantitative measures to evaluate all the programs that are ongoing in our community. So these are just a glimpse into all of the actions and strategies in the action plan. And I hope you have taken the time to read the, the report um, that we have or the community or our stakeholders have prepared for you. Next slide. So in short, our recommendation is to approve the speed management action plan so all our partners can continue to address safety in Hillsborough County and we can have a significant impact on saving lives. So I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Flores, for that presentation. Are there any questions? Are there any questions? I have a, not a question and comment. Uh, question, Commissioner Overman, you recognize. Um, thank you, and I I really appreciate Ms. Paul, Ms. Flores's report. Uh, part of the reason I am sitting in this seat, well, not this one, but this position that I'm in, is as uh, Ms. Torres actually suggested, that our lives have been changed forever, and I've been dealing with the impact of 19 years of trauma as a consequence of a speed event. In, Hill, in, in Tampa. So the importance of this piece is so important. How do we, and I know we had put it on our agenda at one point in time, how do we interface with our state legislators um, when, when they tend to bring legislation to kill, for example, our beacons on Fletcher Avenue that help address this. Um, there's a, a conflict here that we need to proactively address. And I was curious if we have on our agenda to meet with the legislatures regarding MPO priorities and Vision Zero specifically, because this is a, a very important part of the work that we do locally. Um, may I answer part of that, uh, Commissioner? Thank you. Uh, I, yesterday, I was on the quarterly state bike ped coalition safety meeting. So uh, these topics legislatively are talked about there and there we're just trying to move some of these things forward, like the red light running cameras and speed enforced automated speed enforcement. It's a hard, it, it's a hard one, but it's really effective. And it's kind of, those are the types of uh, recommendations that are coming out of these groups. And then I think we've had a request from the legislative delegation to kind of give them some things that they can put on their platform. Uh, Beth, did you, anybody else? My first thoughts. 
Sure, and I, I could respond to the commissioner's question about are, are we planning to meet with the legislators and um, yes, our uh, our fall meeting, uh, the Tampa, Day, Tampa Bay TMA leadership group is going to focus on legislative issues and um, we have invited a couple of our, our legislative delegation members, so we're working to confirm that. Let me uh, let me comment on that, having served up there for a while. Um, first and foremost, you don't need to get part of the legislative delegation. You need to talk to all of the legislative delegation. Now, I don't know if they're going to have a uh, delegation meeting before session starts next year with this pandemic the way it is. Uh, that's when you need to talk to them at, at one setting. You know, they invite part of them to a meeting and part of this meeting. You need to talk to all of them. The most difficult part of that is when they get into session, uh, session moves very, very fast, 60 days, and some way, somehow, you must continue to reemphasize how important uh, the information that you gave them is during that particular session. Now, that's that's a difficult part because you're not going to get be able to talk to every every legislator, every senator, every representative. You got to talk to their staffs and emphasize to those staff members how important it is to get that information to them. That's a difficult part of this whole process. Uh, when you start talking about legislators. Um, talking to them during the delegative session, uh, locally before they go to session, and then once they get in session, get them that information and continues to hop on them. That's, that's the most difficult part of the whole process. Okay, Ms. Williams, you recognize. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Miller. Uh, Ms. Flores, as well as Ms. Torres, thank you for the presentation on Vision Zero. I had a couple of comp questions in regards to your, uh, of course, focus on safe people first, considering a third of the population are not driving. And then uh, you talked about the Fletcher Avenue. I know um, Commissioner Oberman talked about it as well. And they do have those mid-block um, uh, lights where people are crossing over. Personally, myself, I've, I've viewed a uh, number of people not stopping are not aware that that light is blinking and means to stop. And as you as you look at the plan, it talks about education and awareness. What are the, the tactics that you have in mind and to educate people on um, that cross block or some some uh, some others in that area because it's heavily traveled and and I've 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 seen people on the on the line on the side of the road twice as a result of an injury um, in in that location. And so th that would be more my concern. I, I certainly uh, agree with your plan. Something has to happen. I'm just not sure how we get the attention as a fire station. When you know a fire station is coming out of their, their location, you absolutely know to stop. And so I don't know that we have that sense of urgency and how do we get that education and awareness as part of an immediate tactical plan to save our people. I'd like to answer that one. Um, that Fletcher Avenue, by the way, is a county road and the county working with DOT and the surrounding neighborhoods and the community have done a lot of education. Um, they were on the street speaking to people <clears throat> and there was a behavioral study done as long as well as the data of traffic was still moving, the crashes have dropped, but they hid behind different locations and have made observations. Motors were <clears throat> complying with the button being pushed over 90%. And, and pedestrians and whoever is pushing in cyclists or pedestrians actually complied, you know, over 80% in these observations and they'll continue to make those. So I know that you see a few people doing things wrong and, and we're humans make errors if their destination is right across, but at least on Fletcher, they do have an option for a look short distance to make a, a proper crossing. So the numbers are showing that it's working, that those fatalities and serious injuries have dropped. So you are, there's always going to be, you know, but anyway, so the education part of it was pretty intense. They had gone to groups, they stay, stayed out and walked along the roadway to talk to people. They had things that you could hand out. They had stencils on the ground. They did a, a lot, quite a bit. So you're still going to miss a lot of people that way, but at least we can, we, there's, it's, you pointed out a great challenge, um, being able to reach more people with the messages, but we will not stop. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I'm glad I'm encouraged by the results based on what you're saying. So thank you. Thank you, Chairman Miller. 
You're welcome. Commissioner Kemp, you're recognized. Thank you. Uh, first of all, Ms. Flores, your work is always um, so good and so um, a great education for all of us about this and, and greatly appreciated. Um, I have several, and I think one point that um, is forgotten sometimes when you did the list at the beginning of the Florida City, seven out of 10, I think, uh, you know, that have uh, the, the high, highest crash and, and fatality rates in the nation. That's what, uh, sometimes I think people think it's in Florida, but this is for the nation. Seven out of the top 10 are in Florida. It's, it's um, important for us to recognize that. I imagine after seeing your presentations, um, there's all kinds of uh, things that are, you know, we know that it, we're dangerous by design and probably a lot of that is speed. So um, this is, is important and, transformative work for, for us to do here. Um, I just wanted to, uh, in terms of the state, I think one of the issues, and I don't, I think I saw Secretary Gwen, I'm not sure, but but uh, Ms. Alden probably knows this. Um, our SIS, our strategic intermodal system, uh, which is basically our interstates, don't they, um, are, are they by law, do they um, are designated 70% of our, funding um, through the state of Florida each year. Is that accurate? Um, there is a target investment and uh, Secretary Gwynn is on the, on the meeting. Yes, Secretary Gwynn, you, you recognize. So um, yeah, we, we have obviously different pots of money. We, uh, we have money off the top that goes for things like preservation um, of our roads, things like that, or uh, um, the strategic intermodal system Money right now is uh, the goal is 75% of that money is for capacity projects, but we are revisiting that right now to look at whether in urbanized areas uh, like like ours uh, and South Florida and Orlando, we should look at perhaps being more flexible and allowing for some of that strategic intermodal system money to be used for things other than highway capacity. So uh, that is something that's being looked at very closely right now. Thanks. I think when we talk about the legislature, it's one of the things that we have to um, ask and and uh, draw awareness for, because as long as all this funding is directed at that, and usually ex at capacity, we're talking about lane expansion, making those roads bigger, rather than all the arterial roads that we have that are so dangerous and so in need of, um, of, of our uh, resources. Um, so I think that this uh, priority on the CIS is, as you say, even, and I've heard in other areas, is not well placed, especially in urban areas where the needs are so great as we saw from the uh, map that Ms. Flores uh, put out there. And that was just the, uh, the first 20 uh, projects. Um, and we had uh, some 30 more, I guess, that are, um, I hope to be looked at soon. Um, and the third, point I just wanted to make about this is the design manual. Um, as I understand it, you know, there we have our, our national design manuals, but we also have a local Hillsborough County design manual that's being uh, worked on at this time. Is that true, Ms. Alden? Yes. And, and I think it's really important because um, also there's a lot of design exceptions in there that have made and allowed us to continue um, having um, by the by by this manual just dictated by this manual um a, a continue down the path of poor design poor roads poor standards um by the design exceptions but also by some of the dictates in that manual have um continually lead us specifically in hillsborough county under our control um to the the kinds of poor designs that um, cause fatalities and accidents and so as we're looking at this now and i've been trying to get a handle on that quite complicated i look through the design manual it's i think something if i remember right something like 600 pages um and uh you know how that all intersects but i think um, as far as I know that you, uh, Ms. Flores, brought up land use, and that's part of um, the, it's our land use uh, people that deal with that in Hillsborough County, the design manual, as long, uh, along with the traffic. But I think it'd be very important to somehow infuse 
uh, all of this with that with our local design manual. So thanks very much. There's good news there. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, who was speaking? Uh, I'm sorry, this is Gina. I just want to say there's some actually some really good news about your county staff uh, and their interest in this study and in including uh, Paula's input on the design manual. So I think there's good things that are going to come out of this. Great, thank you. Yeah. Councilman like Dingford for a question. Councilman Dingfelder for a question. So you got to unmute yourself. There we go. It's under the loop. There we go. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Gina, and, um, Ms. Flores, uh, thank you so much, Gina. I know you've been working on these issues for decades, and we appreciate it. I'm sure Ms. Flores as well. Um, so I don't know who's controlling the, um, the uh, video portion of this, but if we could go back, if it's possible, could we go back to the next 30 map? I don't know who's controlling that. Okay. Um, thank you. So the let's see the blue. The blue is the uh, are the are the ones we started with, and the green is the next thirty. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. So as I look at it. Um, I'm, I'm concerned about, well, for obvious parochial reasons, I'm concerned about the cities. Um, the, uh, the city of Tampa, um, we, we, we aren't studying, you know, we, we've only got maybe three or four current or proposed studies within the city of Tampa that I can see on that map. Likewise, Temple Terrace uh, looks like you've got one or two and I can't I don't know if that if those go into Plant City at all. Um, I mean, I guess the good news is within the cities, we're not at the highest levels. Is that is that how these were selected? But my question is 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 at what point will the MPO be using our resources to address the city streets? And I don't want to just say the city of Tampa, but if they have issues in Temple Terrace or Plant City, we should be addressing those as well. Oh yeah, um, and by the way, you know these are fatal and serious. You have to get up some speed for those kinds of um, severe crashes to happen. So the city is less likely than you know an arterial that's a little further out um, for those. So that's kind of good news. Um, but your city staff, just for instance, have asked us to fund different studies and that's what we will continue to do so that we can identify recommendations just like the county has done actually for eight of their um, high entry quarters so that's where we come in to being helpful and then you guys prioritize the tip projects that are submitted so this is where you know, where we can start making a difference i guess um and i i don't know where we are in the process being relatively new to the board but I guess I'd, I'd just like to make sure that, um, you know, that that the cities are included at the next opportunity in this type of, you know, detailed, comprehensive look by the MPO. I know we can do it ourselves, and I'm sure we are doing it ourselves to a certain extent. But, uh, but at the next opportunity, uh, from a funding perspective and the kind of in-depth look that you guys are looking at, I'd, I'd like to see uh, more city streets included. So, thank you. Are there any other questions? Commissioner, Commissioner Smith, Smith, you recognize. Thank you, and and just quickly, um, I'm, I'm, I was so thrilled to see this report actually, because um, uh, as, as has been the case with Ms. Torres, um, and I see in Ms. Flores also um, this, um, clarification that it's important to make our decisions based on data, but it's also important to understand that that data, those numbers reflect people and the, the crashes and deaths are actual people's lives. And you all always make those come alive. And, and it's really an important factor of, of our policy making. Um, I'm also excited about this uh, because 
it um, really seems to to give us a roadmap for actions, not just studies. Of course, studies, but it leads to actions, and I'm especially excited to hear that that uh, there's a lot of uh, cooperation and work being done with our county staff on that design manual. I've been bumping up against the same kinds of things Commissioner Kent uh, spoke about uh, as a citizen activist for years before I before I got here. So that uh, I'm pleased to see that we're really going to be finally looking at that because it's not just crashes, of, uh, of course, but it's um, severe. I mean, it's not just deaths and fatalities. It's the kinds of severe injuries that are uh, uh, also can really impact people's lives forever as, as Commissioner Overman alluded to. Um, the It was a very, interesting to see and i don't know if uh staff has an extra comment on this but um the slide that showed uh that 83 percent of our crashes are um at off peak times when we have additional yes it was one more there you go uh non-peak hours and and that points to a conclusion that additional capacity does not make our roads safer. Extra lanes do not make our roads safer. Um, I mean, they might help people, they might have other benefits, but they they do not, prima facie, make our streets safer. Um, and uh, the, a question that I have is, somewhere along the line, Ms. Flores said, uh, and this might uh, apply to what um, Councilman Dingfelder was talking about, how these uh, corridors are selected. And, and she said, high crash is not necessarily our highest need. So um, can, can Ms. Flores uh, uh, explain that a little bit more? Sure, it, Vision Zero is about reducing fatalities and serious injuries. And I think when we went through this prioritization matrix process is that simply just even looking at the severity crash rates shouldn't be the end all, right? We have to consider, you know, the how many schools we have around some of these major arterials. We have to consider, you know, the communities of concern. A lot of these major arterials go through very poor neighborhoods where they don't have a car or are reliant on transit or have to walk or, or ride their bike. So we have to consider, you know, and, and one of the factors that I had in there was transit routes, because if you have a transit route on some of these quarters, most likely you're gonna have significant amount of more pedestrian uh, users within the quarter. But how many of these quarters have you gone to and you see a bus stop and no crossing for people to get across the street safely to it? So when I think about, you know, when I made that statement, it's the fact that let's look at all of these other community factors that also impact safety and exposure rates. And that's the whole thing is looking at all of these other things. And then if you prioritize it based on the need, based on those factors, then you can target some of these quarters where if you're only looking at crash rates, they may have uh, bubbled to the surface, but now you factor all these other things and now all of a sudden maybe different quarters have bubbled to the surface. So that was the whole process and that was a learning experience. And I think it's something, you know, it's a lesson that um, not just at the county level or at the state level, but even the cities can consider that. It's the context in which these quarters really go through and progress through a community that really has to be taken into account. Thank you so much. And it's another example of of data-based decision-making, but also people-based, holistic uh, looking at, at uh, so that we can really get to uh, solutions that work not on in real life, on our streets, not just on paper. And um, so I'd like to move that we adopt the action plan um, if, if we're there, ready for those motions. Second. So you're making a motion to adopt the, uh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, folks. You're making a motion to adopt the, the uh, Vision Zero Speed Management Action Plan, Commissioner Smith? Yes, sir. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner Smith, second by Councilman Dingfelder. Uh, okay. seeing, no further there, seeing no further discussion, please call the roll.
Oh, hold, like on, hold 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 on. Mr. Wagner, do you recognize? Yes, sir. I, I'm sorry. I don't know how where the raise your hand thing is. This I sent a text. Well, it's not right. one. It's not one on. It's not one on here. They they don't have that one here. So go ahead. Yeah, I sent you a, a chat message, but uh, hard for you to run everything and look. Now, at you your know good and well, an old man like me don't know how to handle a chat message. So raise your hand. You ain't that much older than me, but I understand. Oh yeah. <laughs> um. Oh, the point. Uh, going back uh, to the slide and uh, earlier comment by Miss Williams, uh, the the people not obeying the rules and the enforcement, that slide where it showed 60% of the incidents were happening at non-crossing locations on the roadway and 71% were due to aggressive driving speeds, people not paying attention, not doing what they're, all the signs and all the lights tell you to do. Uh, I didn't hear much about the enforcement side of the plan uh, and that's a major component. And uh, maybe in the future we can hear more about what we can do for enforcement. I know I use the street crossing signs, uh, you know, the automated light, flashing lights, and I get kind of animated when I hit the light and the driver will absolutely pay no attention as I step into the street and I send them some sign language and stuff and I shouldn't do that. But um, maybe we can uh, focus on that part of the equation at some time in the future. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other comments before we take the vote? Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner Smith, second by Councilman Dinkfelder. Please call the roll. Commissioner Les Miller? Yes. Charles Kluge? Yes. Councilman Centro? Yes. Councilman Dinkfelder? Yes. Commissioner Ken Hagan? Yes. Melanie Williams? Yes. Pat Kemp? Commissioner? Yes. Kemp. Joe Lapano? Yes. Rick, Mayor Rick Lott or Nate Kilton? Councilman Guido Mascalco? Yes. Michael Marino. Yes. Kimberly, Commissioner Kimberly Overman. Yes. Mayor Andrew Ross. Yes. Commissioner Mary Ellen Smith. Yes. Cindy Stewart or Steve Conan. And Joseph Wagner. Joseph Wagner. All right, yes. Okay. All righty, that's all. By your vote, the motion is adopted. We now move into the USF Fellowship Agreement renewal. Hello, my name is Megan Paterni. Sorry. My name is Megan Paterni and I. Hmm? Oh. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. My name is Megan Paterni and I am a member of the MPO staff. So as in uh, as this year, as in others past, the MPO is looking to sponsor a graduate student fellowship from the University of South Florida. This year's selected student is Fatima Elcott. She has a BS in environmental biology and a minor in anthropology from USF. In August, she will begin her studies in the Department of Urban and Regional Planning at USF. In her application, she states how her background in anthropology has given her the skills to conduct the proper research needed to accommodate the different needs uh, prevalent in a community. She will be assisting the MPO with the Tri-County Interactive Trails Map, along with other tasks and as well as developing other skills and working on various projects. MPO's cost for the 2020-2021 fellow will be 13,750. It is not an increase from last year. We ask the board to authorize the executive director to sign the agreement with USF for placement of the student fellow. Are there any questions? That's a motion by Commissioner Overman, second by- Commissioner Kemp. Commissioner Kemp, 
uh, to approve the USF Fellowship Agreement renewal. Uh, any other questions? Seeing none, please call the roll. And, and Chair Miller, may I please get the spelling of her last name? Sure. My last name is B. Do you want to spell the last name? Sure. The last name of the uh, uh, the fellow. Thank you. Oh, the fellow. Yes, Mr. Teddy, she wants to leave it. Yeah. Elcott. E L K O T T. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Please call the row. Commissioner Les Miller. Yes. Charles Kluge. Yes. Councilman Centro. Yes. Councilman Dave Felder. Yes. Commissioner Hagan. Yes. Melanie Williams. Yes. Pat Kemp. Yes. Kemp. Joe Lapano. Yes. Mayor Rick Lott, Nate Kilton. Councilman Guido Mascalco. Yes. Michael Morano. Yes. Commissioner Kimberly Overman. Yes. Mayor Andrew Ross. Yes. Commissioner Smith. Yes. Cindy Stewart, Steve Kona. The Wagner. Yes. Thank you. By your vote, the motion is adopted. We move now to D, the general planning consultant contracts. Ms. Paterni. Hello. Thank you again, board. So we came here in April to uh, ask you to approve us to go for negotiations uh, with the following nine firms. Next slide, please. So with these nine top ranked teams, uh, which included both these are the primes, and then there were also sub consultants, uh, we went forward and worked on negotiating rates and uh, working on the contracts. Next slide. The following, the following five firms are the- Excuse me, excuse me Ms. Maternity, Ms. Maternity, excuse me, excuse me a minute. Would everyone please put your microphones on mute? Please put your microphones on mute. Okay, continue, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, the following five firms are the ones in bold, Atkins, Fair and Peers, HDR, Kittleson, and VHB um, are the ones that we have completed those uh, contract negotiations with. And so we, uh, we have looked at their rates. Oh, sorry, next slide, please. So with those firms and with the others, we negotiated the labor rates by classification. So anywhere from a GIS specialist, graphic designer, planner, chief engineers. And we used the data from the FDOT District 7 and we used their job classes. There are the FDOT data shows the 25th percentile the average and the 75th percentile. We uh, ask and work with our primes and their subs to <clears throat> have their rates be at the upper limit of the 75th percentile. If they are unable to meet that for whatever reason, they, we request that they must provide justification if the rate was over that limit. So for instance, it could be that they have somebody with a lot of expertise, a specialty that is really valued and will be a great asset to the MPO. And so they have provided that justification. Uh, plus we looked and discussed their multipliers. So their overhead, their cost of capital and their operating margin. We have also, they have also submitted their uh, paperwork from the FDOT that shows where they have been audited and accepted by the FDOT. Next slide. So the contract scope follows the MPO work program and the consultant tasks are to be no negotiated by work order. So some recent examples are resilient Tampa Bay transportation and the plant city transit study with each with its own scope and products. Uh, we do ask for lump sum fees that are negotiated by task. So they're based on the estimated hours and the expenses. So the maximum um, uh, is 300,000 per task. 
Thank you. Oh, next slide. Uh, the contract, so they are signed, one signed, it's two base years with a, an optional th uh, three years, an additional three years. So that, hence why we do it every five years. Uh, so the last one was done in 2015, and now we're here at 2020. The max fees per consultant is, uh, un it can be no more than two million over the life of the contract, and the planning dollars available are 600,000 to 900,000 per year. Next slide. So we'd ask that the, uh, the recommended action is to approve the GPC contracts with the following five firms and the subs. Atkins, Fair and Pierce, HDR Engineering, Kittleson and Associates, and BHB. The contracts for the remaining four of the top ranked teams will be brought forward for your consideration at the first available regular board meeting uh, with that the agreements have been reached. Thank you. Are there any questions? Are there any questions? Are there any questions? Mr. Seeing Chairman. none, is there a motion to approve? Yes. Uh, Who is that? Dave Felder. Yes, Commissioner, I mean, Councilman Dave Felder recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yesterday, um, I chatted with Ms. Alden about this issue. I think it's the issue is fine. I'm ready to vote on it. But I, but I, my question was, especially uh, coming back to the MPO, in regard to our M, uh, WMBE or DB um, uh, process um, for not only consultants but also, I, I don't, I guess we also do engineers. And um, I know uh, Councilman uh, Citro and Maniscalco will confirm that in the city um of tampa we're pushing real hard especially on our pipes program which is a, a billion dollar multi-billion dollar program we're pushing real hard to get our minority and disadvantaged business uh, numbers up out of the single digits and get them up into um approach into the teens um as as everybody knows in the city of tampa minorities represent uh you know, well, depending on how you, how you define minorities, you know, anywhere from 15 to 30 percent of the population. And um, so anyway, so we're, we're very motivated in the city to get those numbers up and get those numbers at, at a minimum up into the teens. So, Beth, if you could uh, explain what our process is briefly, I don't want to drag this on. And um, and and uh, and then I'll have a follow up, Mr. Chairman. Sure. So the, uh, our MPO, like all of the MPOs in the state of Florida, um, participate in the statewide program uh, that promotes disadvantaged enterprises. Um, there is a, a statewide designation um, that, that firms seek. Uh, and we award extra points in our scoring process for selecting um, consultants through this GPC procurement that you've just been looking at. Um, we monitor our expenditures every year. The last two years, our DBE utilization has been 9% and 8% respectively. Uh, and uh, we very happy to uh, push that, see if we can, if we can double digits in our next year. And, and Beth, uh, one, uh, one follow-up question. Um, I know this is just for consultants, um, which you told me it's not a huge amount of money. I think you said 600,000 total is the budget. But um, how about our engineering uh, budget? How big is that? Do we have an engineering budget as well? The, this is it. That's the, that's the sum total of all the uh, funds that we have available for consult professional consultants of any kind, engineers, planners, uh, public engagement pr professionals, mapping, the whole nine yards. Okay. All right. So, Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll support the uh, motion when it when we get to it, um, but I appreciate um, Ms. Alden's uh, comment and effort to really get this number out of the single digits, and I would hope that by this time next year, as a matter of fact, when somebody makes the motion, I, I'd, like, I'd like us to um beth if you could present that in that i know you do a written report that you sent me yesterday 
but if you could present that written report to us uh, at the public meeting every year, I think that would be helpful. And then that way we can all monitor um, the improvements that we're making in the DBE area. So, uh, so I won't make that as a motion, but I'll just make it as a, a friendly suggestion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Happy, happy to do that. Okay, um, Commissioner can't be recognized. Thank you. Uh, uh, Ms. Alden, I just had one more question about that. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, does that also include women? Yes, the the state designation of disadvantaged business enterprises includes minority and owned businesses. Okay. Let me explain to you all what minority owned and disadvantaged businesses live in the state. In the state of Florida, that's women, African Americans, Hispanics, Native Americans, Asian Americans, and I think I just missed one. I uh, can't think of what it is. That's how the state of Florida classifies minority and disadvantaged businesses. For all of you, uh, edification, I've had a conversation with Ms. Beth Eldon and uh, uh, Ms. Uh, my mind just went blank. Uh, oh, the Melissa CEO, uh, Melissa Zarnita, concerning uh, all these, uh, con all of these areas that we're talking about now, including staff, uh, and where we are as far as minorities, including staff. Uh, for your edification uh, in Hillsborough County. Uh, we are, we are, the minority uh, groups are, are growing and uh, that conversation needed to be had with them and they've, they've uh, guaranteed me that these numbers will change and how they're looking at utilizing minorities in all aspects of the agency. So uh, we've had that conversation, okay? But that's how minorities are broken down within state statute. Are there any other questions? Seeing none, is there a motion? Move approval. Motion by Commissioner Overman. Second by Commissioner Kemp. Seeing no further discussion, please call the roll. Commissioner Lothmiller? Yes. Charles Clue? Yes. Councilman Citro? Yes. Councilman Dingfelder? Yes. Commissioner Pagan? Yes. yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Melanie Williams? Yes. Commissioner Kemp? Yes. Joe Lapano? Yes. Mayor Lott or Nate Kilton? Councilman Guido Mascalco? Yes. Michael Marino? Yes. Commissioner Overman? Yes. Mayor Roth? Yes. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Cindy Stewart or Steve Kona? And Joseph Wagner? Yes. Thank you. By your vote, the motion is adopted. We're now moving to status report. Uh, Tampa Bay next update. Who's bringing that from um, the FDOT? Um, Secretary David Gwynn, I'll be starting the conversation if that's all right. Sure, go ahead. All right, thank you. Um, for today's meeting, we were going to be giving a Tampa Bay Next status update, but uh, we're going to do something a little bit different than, than our normal pro uh, presentations where we show each of the projects. Before I get into that, though, I did want to just bring a couple of items up that I, I thought might be of interest given the conversations today. Um, we also share the MPO uh, uh, commitment to looking at ways to reduce speeds and to help with our vulnerable road users. In fact, we had several things recently we've been able to do um, to help move us in that, uh, in that direction. We've doubled the amount of district funds that we are allocating each year to our, uh, to our uh, speed management and complete street uh, projects. That should help us a lot. Um, our, our high school ability projects that we have programmed are also going to move us in that direction. But we currently have some really good projects on Hillsborough, on Bush, on MLK that are going to help us with pedestrian uh, and, and vulnerable users. We also were just found out that we uh, were able to get an additional $4 million from our central office to help us to convert at least another eight corridors to all LED street lighting. We found that that's provided significant uh, increase in the uh, in, in being able to identify pedestrians and bicyclists on our corridors at night. 
Uh, many of our crashes for vulnerable users are in limited lighting conditions, and this will help us out greatly. So we're, we're glad to see this all moving forward in the right direction and being a, a partner in it. Also, I wanted to mention that um, later this week, we should see the third lane on I-275 through the State Road 60 interchange open in the southbound or towards Pinellas direction. Um, hoping without too much weather problem over the next two to three weeks, we expect uh, by mid-August to have the third lane open from Pinellas into Hillsborough. So that essentially will increase capacity by 50% through that bottleneck location. So um, that's about two to three months ahead of original schedule. Uh, we were able to work uh, closely with our partners and the airport and others on, on looking at extending lane closure hours and detours to get that done quicker. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad to say that'll be open up soon. So uh, next slide, please. So as everybody knows, because you were a big part of, of making this happen, uh, last year the governor announced that we were awarded $1.4 billion to construct the improvements to the West Shore Interchange Project, which is, as we know, more than just the interchange of, of 60 and 275, but all the legs coming in and out of it that help connect Pinellas, Pasco, and Hillsborough County, the West Shore Business District, the uh, downtown Tampa, and uh, the Courtney Campbell Causeway as well. Um, one of the biggest challenges we're going to have, because we're only about two years away from advertising this project and three years away from awarding a, a contractor, um, is that we have to build this project under live traffic. Some people say it's like changing a tire on a car. If you can stop the car, pull it over to the side, change the tire, it's not that tough. But if you have to change it while the car is running, it becomes extremely tough. And you have to be innovative in finding ways to do that. The safe trip that you're going to hear about today is one of the tools that we're going to employ that will help us to be able to, to manage traffic during this construction. Next slide, please. Uh, we are fortunate to have uh, actually created a position within our Tampa Bay Next team that will look specifically at tra transportation systems, management and operations, things like this type of, of work. And Margaret Cabillas, who has over 30 years of experience in transportation planning, traffic operations, and TSMNO is leading that for us. And so um, I'm proud to have her here today to talk to you about what we're going to be doing with Safe Trip on the uh, on the project. So, Margaret. Thank you, Secretary Gwen. Um, I really appreciate it, and all the commissioners. I appreciate your attention. Um, we're very excited about the opportunity for um, leading a comprehensive. Um, approach to managing the traffic. And fortunately, we're uh, four years ahead of putting the shovel in the ground, specifically for Tampa's West Shore Interchange and the reconstruction. Um, we all know how important it is. And um, we really are paying attention. Um, some of you know my, my passion for Vision Zero, um, state or countrywide, nationally. And um, I'm very committed to moving this uh, very important project for the region, safely and efficiently uh, managing the traffic. So if we go to the next slide, I think most of you do understand the value of having a safe trip and a comprehensive transportation management plan. This is a standard requirement from federal highways to uh, when you have a program this big um, to have a transportation management plan, it needs to be comprehensive. As we initiated this through the leadership of uh, the district office, we identified four categories. We're referring to these as our elements. The first is traffic management. You would think that that is focused on um, just moving cars, but it is um, very important on creating situations where people are moving smoothly. If they're moving smoothly through the corridor, then hopefully there'll be fewer crashes. And when there are crashes, because we know they're going to happen, um, there are going to be fewer fatalities as well as serious injury crashes. So when they happen, we accept that. And um, our goal is for everyone to walk away or to be able to fully heal without having the long-term detrimental impact to their quality of life for themselves, their families, where they work. Regional demand management is about having uh, transportation choices for everyone um, universally. Look for ways. Uh, teleworking 
you know, who knew <laughs> within our industry, we have promoted teleworking for decades and lo and behold, it can work. It's amazing the, the reduction in capacity that we're able to achieve or um, the demand just through telecommuting. Innovation is the eye in our trip and that includes smart work zones, work zone data exchange and mobility as a service and then public engagement. Um, public engagement is building on the foundation that was already established from when we were TBX and how we listened to what the communities had to say and we've redirected where we are. We are here today with Safe Trip as a part of TV Next and now we want to make sure that we continue to keep open com conversation and comprehensive so people have an opportunity and the, the platform to um, share in information. So let me talk about each of these in a little bit more uh, depth. If we go to the next slide. Um, we are starting with a vision. We've uh, met with several stakeholders and we've had opportunities and listened and we have developed this very comprehensive evaluation um, statement as far as what our vision is for it to be well-planned and innovative. And we wanna make sure that we end up with a safe, reliable um, system that is providing quality transportation choices for individuals, having strategic innovation practices that has a lot to do with data analytics and real-time dissemination of information and that proactive communication to all the users. Um, this isn't gonna happen without having collaboration across the board. So we're looking at ways to leverage not just what DOT brings to the table, but also all that local area network, how the operations, um, we have coordination that's required between the regional traffic management center, as well as all the individual traffic management centers at local government. Next, please. So as I mentioned, we have dropped this in. Um, um, we've identified four elements. Element one being traffic management. Again, safety, safely construct the, the West Shore interchange. Um, safety and reliability. Safety is about having those um, crashes minimal in um, the, any kind of injuries, but also how quickly can we get people out of the way? You know, a crash occurs, move it out of the way and have open roads. Um, and that takes a lot of collaboration, very strong TIM meeting or TIM groups. And uh, reliability, that's about having, yes, you're gonna have to go through, let's say you need to get to the airport. And um, currently it may take you 30 minutes to get to the airport. While we're under construction, it may take you 40 minutes. But we wanna create a situation where it will consistently be 40 minutes um, versus all of a sudden it's an hour and 20 minutes. And it would be great if we had alternative routes. Let's say there is a crash that you have other routes that you would be able to choose. Regional demand management. It is about um, having different um, modes available and have quality choices available. We are, we are addressing freight, um, looking at logistics, making sure that we're pushing information out. So our logistics firms knowing that the, the we have goods, the movement of goods is very important. Um, deliveries within West Shore, how is that gonna be accomplished? Uh, we also wanna make sure that we have good bicycle facilities, um, safe alternative routes for people to take that aren't necessarily on the same um, major roads that we are using today. And then also enhancing transit service. We haven't identified exactly what that means, but we are working with our local and regional transit agencies Innovation is about having a collaborative, um, open innovation, anything that someone wants to bring to the table. And public engagement, uh, proactively, getting the word out, look, putting together those public service announcements, education. We have something that's being introduced within our smart work zones is a zipper merge. That's a really good example. It's considered a late merge. We can provide additional information on that later. That'll be coming up. Uh, next, please. 
So this is uh, looking at the traffic management. The highlighted yellow is all the TB next. Well, the majority of the TB next 275 that will be under construction. But you can see already we are already working with the local governments and looking at how the the local area network is going to support any changes that we have within the system while we're constructing. Um, we'll be constructing under traffic. So it's imperative that we have the relationships for operations, but also we're helping to look at where can we advance projects in order to en enhance the instrumentation um, throughout all these roadways, whether they're state owned or even locally owned. Next, please. The regional demand and management, right now we're focusing strongly on the um, origin destination. For instance, we already know that there's a strong, a strong relationship between what happens in downtown as well as um, people moving to the West Shore area or the interaction between those two hubs. What about what's going down in um, Soho, you know, South Tampa? Are there people there that could be possibly be using alternative micro mobility? You had, there was a great study that was done recently um, for the successes of using the scooters. That might be a viable alternative for people to look at. So we're just looking at how can we have a robust system layered in with the roadway system that we already have and people are using their single occupancy vehicles. Next, please. On the innovation, I mentioned the uh, smart work zones. So how, I'm just going to give you a very high level on um, one of the uh, the events, we already have a pilot project that we're trying to hone in on to apply to the existing gateway project, which is in Pinellas. But we also have other pilot projects that we want to deploy throughout Hillsborough as well. Um, here's a simple example. One of our goals is to harmonize traffic um, in order to make it safer for everyone that's going through the work zone. Um, as you look for the, the yellow area, consider that the work zone on the far left or in the middle of the, the slide, you would be able to see where we have some um, green dots. Those are sensors that are detecting the volume of traffic that's, mess that's passing through the work zone as well as the speed. In this smart work zone, it's all automated. So those speeds that are be de being detected within the work zone would actually project and automatically change the speed limits as advisory, possibly regulatory, but those would go upstream. So anyone that's uh, approaching the work zone, all those drivers will be notified in real time the speed of the vehicles ahead of them. We're not telling them the speed that we want them to drive. We are telling them this is the speed that is ahead of you. So if it's still 60 miles an hour, we're telling them it's still 60 miles an hour. But if it's dropping to 40 or 30, we're telling them it's 30 miles per hour ahead of you, by the way, don't run in the back of the queue. You know, slow your vehicle down, please, out of safety. We would love to be able to have um, enforcement layered in there. And we are working very aggressively on making sure that we have all the, um, the policies and the capabilities to make all that happen. So it's very complex. Uh, next slide, please. And then public engagement. As I mentioned before, we are building on the structure that we had established previously, but under Safe Trip, we have identified um, a community advisory. Oh, let's see. Um, oh gosh, it's a CAT. I know that. <laughs> and several of um, the people within the area are on that. Um, but we do have a very good network in for in order to push out information and we're getting ahead of that. You, within Hillsborough, through the MPO, we are presenting to you, we've already presented to the ITS committee, and we have several ones coming up. We are also gonna be presenting next week at the Smart Cities Alliance. So we continue to push this message so everyone understands what we're trying to accomplish, because we only have four years to get the word out and people to truly understand what we are trying to accomplish here. Next, please. So the task force minute, that's what it is. The T is for task force. <laughs> um, but these are, these are, this is a representation of the, the different organizations that are participating with the task force. 
But then beyond that, we have smaller groups. So this is the overarching, but then we do have smaller groups that we're gonna be meeting with as well, because we wanna understand those perspectives. And without having the perspective of all the individual groups, we aren't gonna be able to develop a comprehensive plan. We're not saying that we're gonna be able to accommodate everyone, but we certainly wanna make decisions with that information on the table. We don't wanna be blindsided two years from now. Um, and we want to make sure that we're staying on track. Next, please. We also have um, already met with um, two organizations. We've met with the I-4 Ultimate Team to get their lessons learned over there in Orlando. And then we've also met with the Missouri DOT where they rebuilt and re they reconstructed a, two segments of I-64. Um, they were able to close down traffic, but we've already heard from them and we've already made adjustments based on their lessons learned. We have meetings already scheduled with um, I-66 I um, up in um, Virginia. And um, we also are working on establishing a lessons learned with the Wisconsin DOT. Next, please. Just so you understand, as far as the schedule, so we are in the development of Safe Trip. That's the place that we are right now. We started in the spring. We've already established a lot of organization to this. Um, we are, we expect in the spring, we'll have our transportation management plan, that initial document that's going to formulate and be our guidepost as we move forward. Um, and then we have already started, even though this says 2022, uh, 2023 of deployment, we've already started. We've already identified opportunities to advance construction on a few elements. And we wanna make sure that everyone's, everything stays in schedule. Once we put the shovel in the ground, we are also gonna put forth practices where the contractor will engage with us to continuously adjust the management plan based on the conditions that they're experiencing. So this will be a live document and the contractors will participate. And that is a lesson learned that we got directly from um, I-4 Ultimate. Next, please. So um, that's an overview of Safe Trip, And I would love to hear your questions and we can continue the conversation if we run out of time. Thank you. Are there any questions? Are there any questions? I have a question, please. Commissioner Overman, you recognize. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Margaret, for your presentation. And, and I'm glad the secretary mentioned earlier the, the idea of uh, how we make decisions and where our dollars are spent when it comes to balancing safety and capacity. Um, and with that, that in mind, I, I appreciate the work that you're doing now, but I'm, I'm still wrestling with our last TIP approval and the issue associated with capacity utilizing tolls as a, a means of moving forward. And so um, while this is a great project and you don't need approval for particularly the project, but I'd like to ask for a report for the next meeting. Um, in line with balancing safety vision zero efforts the the management that you're doing now mm -hmm. as well as projects that we've approved for the tip mm -hmm. um over the next five years i'd like to get a report back on any projects on the tip list that are utilizing um either a toll process or a, you know, exp express ray type of process uh, in its plan. Um, we are going to have a managed lane workshop in October, mm -hmm. but I think if we have some perspective on how we balance safety and capacity, um, maybe more towards safety rather than capacity, we may be able to achieve the managed lane goals. And this exercise that you just provided us gives us some good ideas about how we do that mm -hmm. in our design. Mm -hmm. um, as I mentioned in the tip hearing, you know, if you do insurance, every solution is insurance. 
if you do transportation design and your focus has been toll roads, that's going to be what you get when you're adding capacity. But that isn't necessarily what we're trying to accomplish here when we balance safety and management of that safety on our on our major roads. Um, so I'd like to ask FDOT to come back to us at the next meeting to identify any projects that are currently in the queue on the tip to um, identify any of those that are possibly going to use a toll feature for managing the speed and the safety and the additional capacity needs on those projects. Because I'd rather know ahead of time as you're doing with this project, you know, making sure we're looking ahead and get, making it safe. I think this is a, an important part of what we are gonna be looking at, especially as we approach that managed lane workshop in October. And yes, I'll work. I'll do it. Um, yes, we can, um, I've made note of that and I can give that feedback to um, the, my partners within DOT. Um, as far as um, the, the tip goes, I wanna express the appreciation. We have three projects that we are already started um, in regard to instrumentation on the corridors the, um, that are adjacent to 275 in order to manage any kind of um, crashes that are on the corridors as well as while we're under construction. So um, that's all about instrumentation and it's adding um, the ability for us to help manage traffic and run it more efficiently. And that doesn't mean speed wise, that doesn't mean you're getting them through faster um, and risking safe, safety of anyone else that's on the corridor. It's just a matter of using the instrumentation in order to manage the corridor more efficiently for everyone. Thank you. Are there any other, uh, are there any other questions? Are yes. there any other questions? Yes, sir. Okay. Pardon me? Dingfelder and then I'll see Smith. Smith. Okay. Councilman Dingfelder, you recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I agree with, um, uh, with Commissioner Overman, uh, the great concerns about the toll issue and look forward to a lot of robust uh, discussion on that. But my question, um, Ms. Kublins, is um, as related to your traffic management plan, the task force, I saw a lot of, I saw a lot of sort of corporate uh, government entities there. I don't know if I saw many neighborhood uh, entities mentioned on your task force. Mm -hmm. um clearly as this goes through the city of tampa you know we all can probably identify at least uh, a dozen or more specific neighborhoods that it's going you know that the project goes through or is very near to and i think it's extremely important mm -hmm. not only that the city of tampa uh traffic folks get out there into the neighborhoods early and often but also that the dot does in terms of the traffic management plans um, not necessarily will the road be built or, or not, and, you know, that, that issue is, is done, but, but in regard to those plans. So what is your plan to reach out to the neighborhoods? Thank you so much for that question, very specifically. Um, in the, the history that we've had related to um, multiple conversations, um, we have identified specific champions within specific neighborhoods. And we have found that the, the, the venue or the organization of the meetings is vitally important in order to hear the voices most accurately. And the, the CAT, you are exactly right. It is um, corporate. It is very strong in the organizations and very formalized in those organizations. And that is the right place for us to have those voices heard. Um, we have focus groups in the neighborhoods. We have champions within those neighborhoods and we are well established, have very good relationships at those levels. And we, we have a plan. I don't have it in front of me, um, but we do have a plan and I apologize it didn't, um, talk about that more. And so I'm really grateful that you brought that question up because we do have those networks established and all of those groups will be let, we will reach out to them in the next six months. So Mr. Chairman, just a, a quick follow-up. Maybe um, uh, maybe you, sh 
you could or should identify, you know, at least one or two people within each one of those organizations, uh, like let's say Beach Park Neighborhood Association. They're not necessarily right on top of the road, but definitely impacted. Mm -hmm. But you know, to to disseminate that information to their organization, so you don't have to, you know, so, so that, you know they know who's in their organization. They've got the social media already set up, so when you've got announcements and that sort of thing, you can, you know, spread it out uh, effectively. So, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mark. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Smith. You recognize. Thank you. Um, so, and I support everything that uh, Commissioner Overman and Councilman Dingfelder were saying about the, um, you know, bringing back more discussion about uh, tolling and managed lanes, as well as making sure we have public engagement there. Um, and and adding to that, um, I would like to see more uh, discussion about. Well, I would I would like to make sure that there is a public process as we determine how the managed lanes are going to be managed, given the MPO mission of ensuring that disadvantaged communities are not negatively impacted economically or otherwise by highway projects through each community, um, it's, it's really important for the MPO to, to uh, make sure that we uh, have a public process of determining how we're going to manage those toll lanes that it's that it's not just an institutional thing that it that we do have a, a robust public process of that so when you bring back the uh, the tolls um, uh, the managed lanes maybe we can talk about that and then uh, the only other thing is if you could go to um, slide six in your presentation if if is it if it's possible to bring that up for a quick mm -hmm. couple of questions um and and this kind of raises the point that i know some of us have made um uh, before that we prefer to have these um presentations ahead of time so that we can really get into the nuts and bolts before they whiz by um it, it might make things uh, for a more efficient um process and, but i and i'd certainly like to see have this report um uh, sent afterwards um but mm -hmm. looking at the, this uh, the yellow bullet regional demand management there's there's a strategy a goal of providing an enhanced transit service during the construction i think that's uh, a, a great um way to to help um uh, offset the the you know the inconvenience and the traffic problems we're going to have but it's the first i've heard of it though um so i hope to hear more of that and and i'm skeptical of uh, another comment you made there that um well i'm skeptical of the uh, advantage we would get from including micro mobility or scooters um as as a large part of the solution to the um traffic impacts of this uh construction but i but i'm uh, optimistic about working with hard and hopefully get some extra funding from fdot to uh bolster the um transit at least during during that process and I was also my ears pricked up at your mention of the zipper merge. That's the the first I've heard FDOT talking about that. I've I know that other countries um, mm -hmm. really do a lot with that, as opposed to the long lanes of stacking. And and it's the long lanes of stacking that I've heard from FDOT. This is the first time I've heard uh, uh, zipper merge, um, mm -hmm. uh, which is is a, a really important tool to um, uh, working through some of the bottlenecks. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to get into that today, but I hope that we hear more from FDOT about how that works and how we can implement that here uh, in, in our community. Um, thank you. Well, thank, thank you, you for all this. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead, Well, I just, um, thank you. Um, I just wanted to respond to, um, mm -hmm. I appreciate all those comments, and I know that we will be able to get back to you more about the managed lanes. 
Um, this is the infancy of this presentation as far as the smart trip goals. I mean, as far as smart trip, I mean, this is, we just started presenting this last month. Um, or I guess we are already at the end of July, so it would be this month. <laughs> um, the micromobility question, as well as transit, um, we are paying attention to it, and it's not a matter of being able to have a significant reduction in the percentages. We want to be realistic, recognizing the, the, um, the expectation of individuals. But it is similar to any kind of um, pedestrian and bicycle planning that we do. We aren't looking to um, make huge uh, changes within the percentages. What we're doing is trying to provide a robust quality network in order for people to have transportation choices for quality of life. I mean, I it makes a difference whether you can get on your bicycle and ride two miles to get to downtown um, in a safe way, or are you completely inhibited from actually making that route because it's so dominated by cars and they're driving really fast. So it's not, we're not necessarily gonna achieve any high percentages. It's more about quality of life for the region. Um, there, okay, I'm gonna get off, <laughs> but anyway. That's, I just want to keep that in perspective, um, and you will hear more about um, Zipper Merge. Zipper Merge is, it is a proven way to manage, and um, you, we will not be able to be successful with that without a lot of public engagement and education. It's huge on the education piece, and you know we're just getting started in that, so we want you to be at the beginning. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move now to the... Commissioner, I have a question. Commissioner Kemp, you're recognized for a question. Thank you. Um, and I don't know if, if maybe David Gwen or Secretary Gwen could comment on this or if it's um, something, but when I see the scope of this, especially just including scooters and transit and, and that, um, one thing I always, uh, that I had understood about SunRail was that it was done in Orlando, the, uh, rail, the CSX converted uh, rail to a commuter system there, um, was done as a mitigation um, for the uh, ultimate I-4 that they were doing there and parallel to it, as as is true here for, you know, going straight from USF to downtown. And I'm just wondering if somehow that that can make its way uh, into the scope of being looked at for this project. Um, but it makes sense to me that it would be in the scope of this in some way, but um, you know, I, I know it's not there, but I'd like to um, see if that could maybe be part of this. Yeah, actually it is part of it. We're, um, we're going to be using uh, MOT funds to fund transit improvements that'll provide um, an alternate uh, transportation means through the corridor. Um, in this case, we'd have to show that it would improve it through the corridor where we're uh, wanting to to keep the traffic uh, down, but um, most of that will probably be bus type of service um, as it's scheduled now. How about in terms of when you're looking at, because part of this I saw on that map was a big yellow line that went from West Shore right up to 75 uh, North to USF. So, and, and I know that that's still on our tip now, um, I, to me, unfortunately, but um, since it is, it is a parallel corridor to um, half of that corridor that goes north-south. So um, can that be, that's right, can that be considered now? Because, uh, I, you know, it just makes sense to me that that would be, uh, that is an upcoming, as long as we're looking at it now as being on the tip still uh, for the future. Um, I would hope that it could be something that we could start looking at now. We all know these things go on for years. Yeah, we could work with hard on that. Um, I'll be honest, the amount of time it probably will take to get right away, to get federal approval, to get all the funding and interlocal agreements, I'm not sure there would be enough time to get it done by the time that we're going to start this project, which is three years away. Um, but we're starting to work with heart to look for 
any way we can to partner, and there will be money in our budget for uh, transit to help during the construction of the project. Sunrail, I think, in, in that case, they had a whole lot more um, head start uh, on the I-4 Ultimate, and so, and there also was a pretty big federal champion that uh, made that happen, so, uh, but we'll, we'll look at anything uh, uh, working with heart on these. Okay. Okay, thank you. I know we have a big federal champion here with the, with Congresswoman Castor. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, now we're now going to move on to the deck of the report, Ms. Alden. Mr. Chairman, uh, just one other question on traffic management. Uh, Mr. Dinkfelder, you, Mr. Dinkfelder. Just one other. You've already, asked, you've already asked two questions. You want to ask another question? Uh, I think I've only asked one question on this thing, but who, who's keeping track? Thank you. Very, Go ahead. Just very quickly. I'm, I'm um, keeping track. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Secretary, will will the DOT consider working with the city to uh, to fund more bike lane uh, projects? And we appreciate your your prior funding on that. But as as this uh, big kind of mess starts, uh, will you consider working with the city to fund more bike lane projects as alternative transportation through those work zone areas and the impacted neighborhoods? Yeah, in fact, we actually are, and, and we, uh, we're working with the city very closely. We, we just were able to find a couple more million dollars to give them for the green spine um, to be able to push that forward. We're also working real closely with them on the trails down in the, uh, the West Shore area. It'll connect to the Howard Franklin Trail that we're building across the bay. So there's a, a lot of heights. There's, there's a lot of bike and uh, ped improvements already funded, and, and we'll continue to do that. But if, if we can, if we identify some more, you guys will be amenable to look at it with us. We always are. We, we, we work together to find the funding for it, and we've been successful so far. So um, we'll continue to do that. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Second director report, Ms. Alden. Um, thank you, sir. Um, board members, we are coming into a time of, of some uncertainty about our meeting logistics. If the uh, governor does not extend the executive order, which allows us to meet virtually, then our next board meeting on September 1st, we will need to have at least a quorum of our board members physically present in a room. Uh, I know that there are still concerns uh, about being physically present. And so we'll be working with HDB and county facilities to determine what we can provide in terms of like a hybrid approach. Um, but we, we uh, would be looking in that case to, to have uh, nine board members who are willing to be physically present, um, even if the rest are participating uh, virtually. So uh, I will be back in touch with you over the next month uh, as this situation continues to evolve. Um, and on that note, the two items here on the agenda under executive director's report, uh, we had scheduled the annual public hearing of independent oversight committee for the transportation sales surtax. We had scheduled that for August 11th. Um, the, uh, the oversight committee would prefer to meet virtually and so uh, we, have, we have postponed that. We have not set a new date. We are waiting to see if the governor will extend the executive order. Our Vision Zero Leadership Summit um, does not require an action, so we can do that entirely virtually if you care to do that. Um, if it is reasonable and safe for us to meet in person by the 22nd of September, uh, the city of Tampa has provided the Julian B. Lane Riverfront Center uh, and again, we could also consider a hybrid approach there where we have, for example, some policy committee members meeting in person at a distance, but all of our audience members participating virtually. So, you know, again, we'll be continuing to explore uh, what the options are. Please keep your eyes peeled as things continue to evolve. We will continue to post our meeting logistics up on the MPO website at hillsboroughmpo.org. On the home page on the calendar, there's links to the meeting logistics, and we will keep that updated uh, on, an, on a daily basis. Um, 
uh, you have in your electronic board folders a copy of the MPO's quarterly report on use of our federal planning grant dollars uh, and uh, a copy of our monthly newsletter. And then I also wanted to know that wanted to let you know that uh, Plan Hillsboro as an organization um, has joined a, a national group, Transportation for America, um, which is a, a group that's very closely aligned with the um, the goals and priorities you've adopted in your uh, It's Time Hillsboro Long Range Transportation Plan. Uh, but tra Transportation for America works at the national level. It connects uh, local organizations like ours, uh, but not only MPOs, regional planning councils, chambers of commerce, um, local governments all across the country, uh, and involves them with, uh, with research and analysis, policy and advocacy, and technical assistance. So um, Transportation for America does provide those resources uh, to uh, all of our board members. They are available to you. Uh, as well as to all of our staff members. And so I will be providing your email addresses to Transportation for America, unless you'd like me not to do that. Uh, and that's just so that you'll be aware of what those resources are. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Ms. Alders. Any questions? Commissioner Kemp, you uh, recognize. I have, thank you. I just wanna thank you. I think it's wonderful that we're a member now of Transportation for America. I look forward to being able to use uh, as an organization and individually those resources. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, Ms. Alden? Any other questions? Thank you, Ms. Alden. Is there any old or new business to come before us today? Any old or new business? Seeing none, thank each and every one of you for being here today. We appreciate it. And with that, we'll adjourn. Have a good day. Thanks, Thanks everyone.